or, or try to emulate them in our own life as well. And week, and week one, if we were not here, uh, we looked at defining moments. Defining moments or seasons in our life. And Joshua, if you remember, was content on being Moses' just second, second-hand second guy. He was, he was Moses' assistant, and he was very, very content on, on being Moses' assistant. And then Moses dies. And God puts his hand and chooses Joshua to lead the people into the promised land and to fulfill their destiny that God has promised them under the leadership of Joshua. And when we one, we looked at how Joshua was a leader during a time of transition. And we looked at some of the transition times in our lives, those, those times between seasons, if you will. And then last week in part two, we learned that when the Israelites and other Joshua's leadership arrived at their destiny and found the promised land, they realized it was already occupied by other people. And God asked, uh, excuse me, God asked Joshua to do some crazy stuff, some uncommon things that, it, that eventually drove the people out of the inhabited land. The first city was Jericho. And God said at the very first city of this vast land that God was going to give to Israel, God says to Joshua, Joshua, you have to trust me in an uncommon way. Before this thing goes any further, it is important that God is saying to Joshua that Jericho is just the beginning. The city of Jericho is just the beginning. Joshua, I got to know from the get-go, I got to know Joshua from the beginning, God is asking him, if you are going to rely on your own strength, or are you going to rely on mine? At the very beginning. And I think it's interesting that God needed to know as they moved forward together to conquer more land, that Joshua, God needed to know that would Joshua pause and say, okay God, how do you want me to do this? It's also interesting that Jericho, the very first city, God has to know, God has to know if Joshua is going to follow his lead. If, if Joshua's going to follow God's lead in this. And as we, we read last week, we read in the next six chapters of Joshua, the Israelites go on this, what I want to call, the biggest winning streak of all time. We see under Joshua's leadership, the people of Israel begin to conquer land after land after land. They begin to conquer territory after territory after territory like crazy. And then we get to chapter 12 of the book of Joshua. In the book of Joshua, in the first six chapters of, of the verse, or chapter 12, tells that the land the Israelites acquired under Moses, as Joshua was Moses' commander-in-chief. So, so the first six verses tells, tells of the land that, that under Moses' leadership, under his leadership, that they conquered. Six verses. Tells the details, these, these cities that Moses conquered, they conquered under Moses. And then seven verses, the, then in verse 7, the rest of chapter 12, it tells in great detail the areas of land, the kings and kingdoms that were conquered under, conquered under Joshua. And it's purposely stated this way. Because you need to know from the get-go that Moses, under his leadership, the people took a little bit of land. And under Joshua, they took a whole lot of land. And if, if you will, if you want to, it's not on the board, but if you have your Bibles, if you want to, you want to turn to me. It, it, it just, um, in chapter 12, verse 7, it says, here's the, the kings of the land that Joshua and Israel conquered on the west side of the Jordan. And, and God, and they begin to list, list these territories. And then it goes on, and it says, you know, they're the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Presidites, the Hivites, the Jesuites. I just said that so y'all can see the seminary paid off and I can pronounce it, you know, names. They don't mean nothing. But then it goes, then it goes in, it goes in, it goes in, it says, the king of Jericho, the king of Ireland, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Harrow, the king, and it, it lists king after king after king after king. These people, these people conquered. And if you look it up in your book, in my translation of the Bible, you look after each king in each city, it says one. It says one. King of Jericho, one. King of Allah, one. King of Jerusalem, one. King of Harrow. One. It has one after each and every one, and it goes to this list, and, and then at the very end it says there were 31 kings in all. 31. Moses took a few, Joshua took 31.
one kingdoms and all up to this point. And I don't care if you throw uh, horseshoes. I don't care if you play cards. I don't care what you do in your life. If you go on a 31 win streak, that's, in, that's depressing. No matter what. And they go on this 31, and after chapter 12, at the beginning of chapter 13, after they've had this thir 31 winning streak going on, Here's what I believe is the most pivotal and a huge transition moment in the life of Joshua, as well as the millions of people Joshua was under his leadership. Join with me on the border or, or read along in your Bible. Joshua 13, verse 1. When Joshua, Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, You are now very old. Now, if God calls you old, you're old. Just saying. All right. And, and there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. God says to Joshua, you are old. You are old. But there are still large areas of land to be taken over. Joshua, you have been on an incredible run. You have been on an incredible winning streak. You have done, what do you have done to inhabit the land that I promised these people? God is saying is unprecedented. No one has ever done that before. And this is a pivotal moment in Joshua's life, but it is also the most dangerous time of his life. Because Joshua is looking back over his life and saying, you're right, God, we've been successful. I mean, look what all we've accomplished. Great job, everyone. And I'm sure... I am sure Joshua is waking up every morning and his back is hurting from all those battles. I'm sure he's, he's waking up every mo mo morning and there's old wounds from battles. And he's saying, God, God, can't we just be done with all this fighting? Can't we just be done with the wars? Uh, look, look, God, I'm old. You even called me old yourself. And God says, Joshua, I've not called you to settle yet. I'm not ready to back off. I'm not ready to slow down. I'm not calling you to relent, Joshua. I'm calling you to advance. And I believe that, that God has a word for each of us this morning. I believe in my heart that many of us are looking back over our lives, or we're looking back over a season of our lives, or we're looking at our lives not right now, and we're saying, you know, we, we've done pretty good. You know, I, we we're looking back and saying, you know, I'm feeling pretty old. We've been pretty successful. I do. And every morning, I feel, I feel older and older. I believe in my heart that some of us are in some area of our life that we're feeling stuck. That we're feeling tired. That we're feeling scared from dealing with the same thing over and over and over and over again. And whatever it is, maybe we either, we, we, we fail or, or maybe we got stuck or maybe we've accomplished a lot in our lives and we're worn out and we just need rest. We just need a moment to just stop pedaling and coast a little bit. And we begin to not pedal as hard. And we begin to lay off the throttle a little bit in our relationships. And maybe it's just, maybe we just stop pedaling in our careers. Or maybe we just stop pedaling in our faith. I believe for some of us, there's, there are areas of our life, or maybe our whole life in, in, in general, where we just kind of put on autopilot a little bit. And we just sort of started to glide a little bit. And maybe the word for us this morning from God is that God has called you, has not called you to stop pedaling. God has not called us to stop pedaling because we're not there yet. God is not done with you yet. God is calling us as followers of Jesus Christ to advance. To advance. And for some of us, that, that looks like having to deal with our past. And you, and you say to yourself, I'm in a good place right now. I've put the past behind me. I don't need to go back and, and deal with those things. I don't need to drum up those old feelings or those, those old resentments or those anger. God would say, until you deal with your past, you're not able to advance to what God has for you in the future in any area of your life. And in some of that, that's our careers. In some of that, that's our relationships. Because we're at a place where we feel sort of successful. We do. But God will say, there's something beyond success. It's 
of significance. And maybe that's where we're stuck. And being significant is what advancement looks like to you. And I don't know what is going on in your life, but I do know God is not calling you to look back or look around on your life and say things could be worse, this is good enough. No, He's calling us to advance in many areas of our life. And I have always, always said and strongly believe that what is good for individuals is also good for churches. So let's be honest. Let's be honest. Past months, past few years around our faith community have been breathtaking. I mean, there's not, there's not a week that goes by that I don't get somewhere, somehow, either some form of, of, of communication or someone stops me in the grocery store or out in the community and, and someone doesn't say that, you know, their life is, is, is different because of, of the ministry that we do here. And, and I've said it before, it's a movement of God. People are reinvesting in their faith again. They're, they're looking out for their community in a different way. God's Spirit is moving among us like never before. And I think like Joshua, I believe that we are in a very dangerous place as a church. You see, we're at a place where we can look back over the past 15 years. We can look back and say, you know what, we've been through a lot. We've been through a lot of leadership change, both pastoral and labor leadership. You know, you know, we, we can look back and say, you know what, we've conquered a lot of land. We can look back and say, you know, we've been through some tough times. We've talked, fought some tough battles with one another. But you know what? We can look back and say, and through it all, we remained open when other churches were closing. I believe that, that God is challenging us just as He challenges us in our own personal life. He's challenging us as a church just like He challenged Joshua did. God is challenging us not to relent. It would be easy for all of us to, to pull off the throttle and close, coast a little bit. But I feel God is calling us into a season of advancement. God has given us a clear vision of connecting people to the love of Jesus Christ. And that's a good vision. We've got to take that vision and we've got to place it in our hearts. And it's got to drive us and mold us and move us. And this only happens as you and I who call First Christian Church our home will grab a hold of that vision and say, God, we will advance with you. Whatever territory you want to take us to. In Joshua 13.2, right after the first, after he says, God is... God is Tells Joshua he's old. After he says, yeah, but there's still land. He goes, this is the land that remains. And then God goes into great detail. The land that is yet to be taken. So all of chapter 13 of the book of Joshua. All of chapter 14 of the book of Joshua. God begins to point out all the land that still needs to be conquered. And I, I want to outline, just like Joshua, I'd like to outline three areas of advancement in our personal life and in our church life that I believe God wants us to pursue in, in, in our community. Three areas of land, if you will. Areas that remain for us as a church to possess in the coming days, weeks, and, and, and months. The first area of advancement. God is calling us to advance to the broken the poor, and the forgotten of our city. I believe God is calling us to advance to the broken, the poor, and the forgotten of our city. It's interesting if you begin to, to study the life of Jesus Christ in, in all four Gospels, it doesn't matter. When you look at, look at Jesus and His ministry, if you look at it as a whole, you will begin to see a pattern. There's, there's a pattern in, in Jesus' life. There's a pattern in, in, in His ministry to, to people while He's in on earth. And this pattern is that, that if you'll notice that, that Jesus almost tolerates the religious crowd in this. I mean, there's this religious crowd that's always trying to, to trick Jesus. I mean, there's, this, there's these church folks that are always trying to ask Jesus these, these tricky questions about the law and about the, the Scripture. And at best, you know, at, at best, Jesus just sort of tolerates them. He, he doesn't really rebuke them. He answers their question. And I believe that when Jesus answers their question, it kind of puts them in your place. You 
you will, or when the question is asked, I truly believe Jesus' heart is broken here. But, but they're always hitting him with questions about, about religious things, about policy, and about procedure of, of the law of the church. And you see this attitude of Jesus when he sort of just sort of tolerates them. But it's the marginal. It's the hurting. It's the broken. It's the forgotten people that Jesus sort of migrates to. It's, it's, the, it's the lame. It's the sick. It's the children. And, and, and Jesus is like, you religious people, you know, you can do what you want to do, and, and that's okay with me. But Jesus is almost like, always, you know, my heart breaks for the children. My heart breaks for the needy, for the poor. And one of the stories that I love the best about Jesus, is, is, is always, is, is there's this story they tell us, and, and Jesus is, is, is sitting there, and he has all these children around him. All these kids, and I'm sure they're climbing on his back and they're jumping on him, and, and, and Jesus is laughing with them, and he's talking with them, and he's playing games with them, and, and then he begins to pray with these little kids. And Jesus' own guys, his own disciples, his own followers come along, and they try to shoo the kids away. They try to get away from Jesus, leave him alone. Move along. We've got religious, important church stuff to talk about. And you know what Jesus does? He rebukes them. Jesus rebukes them and says, you've got it all wrong. The point is the kids. The point is the kids. And we believe we are a Jesus kind of church. And I believe that we will tolerate the religion, religious types. And that's okay. But if we're going to be caught doing something, we are going to be, going to be caught doing ministry like Jesus Christ. We will be found dedicating our money, our time, our resources, and our attention to the lost, to the hurting, to the broken, to the unchurched, to the poor, to the lame, to the sick, to the marginalized, and to the children of our city. Why? Because that's what it means to be a Jesus church. We are coming upon Centralia Group Work Camp for the second time. For the second time. And it is a wonderful, awesome thing. Randy and Steve and, a mother, and, and Becky and a bunch of other people have, have, have just been going, working so hard about, about that. And if you don't think it's a Jesus thing, you know, just look back and see how we got $15,000 from a city when on the same night they said they got a bill for $3,300,000 and they were broke. That's a God thing. Give that a hand. That is a God thing. We, God didn't. Get blood out of the tournament. Turn it down. <laughs> but you know what? That is only established trust in our community for our church. That's it. You know, because, because the lost, because the broken, because the lame, because the sick, because the, the marginalized, the one everyone's forgot about. Other churches have come in and said, we're going to do something, and they've been burned by people like us. And we have just established trust. And that's a good thing, but that just means now is the time for advancement. Second area, I believe God is calling us, is God's calling us in an advancement to serve. Chapter 13 and 14 goes into great detail, specifically again about what area is needed to be conquered and in what order. And in all of this, I'm sure Joshua is feeling even older. Remember, God even called Joshua over. But in the middle of chapter 14, which we're fixed to look at, beginning at verse 6, is I believe the neatest exchange between Joshua and his best friend and counterpart, Caleb. Now, I'm going to have to take the time out right now. i got to rewind a little bit. I've got to rewind, rewind about 40, 50 years, even, even before that. When Moses was the leader of the people of Israel, and they were wandering around lost in the desert, the people became impatient. The people became complaining about, uh, to God about God, about Moses, and about everything else. So God tells Moses, he says, what I want you to do is I want you to send two spies into the land of Ephesus. I'm going to give you one day. And I want those spies to go, and I want them to come back and report what they see. And of course they go, and they see, and they come back and report how awesome, how wonderful, how great this land is that God is going to give them. Those two spies were Joshua and Caleb. Turn with me to chapter 14, or join on 
on the screen. And this exchange between Joshua and Caleb in the middle of Joshua feeling old, in the middle of God telling Joshua all the land that he still had to come. Now the people of Judea was approached by Joshua and Gaul, and Caleb, the son of Judah, the Kizites, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. Caleb says, Joshua, do you remember 45 years ago when, when, when God said what God said about you and, you and me? Remember what he said? Remember how he, 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 he sent us out? Jump down, down to verse 10. He says, now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while the Israelites moved about the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. He says, remember, God has kept me alive, and here's why. And this is awesome. This is, this is my favorite part. Look at verse, verse 11. He says, I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out of battle now as I was then. He says, I ain't old yet. I'm 85. I ain't old yet. I will go to battle with you. I am just as strong. I am just as mighty. I am just as fierce. Let's go fight. 85 years old. He says, let's do it. He says, let's do it. I love that. Let's show them whippersnappers. Let's go. Just as feisty and vigorous. Go, Caleb. But to do what God has called us to do, as a faith community, it's going to take more of us. God is calling some Joshua's today to, to, to step up, but God is also calling some Caleb's. Some people have been making up excuses. You know, Caleb was 85 years old. I won't say what's your excuse, but Caleb was 85 years old. And some people have been saying, you know what? I'll just let the young people do it. You know what? Some people are saying, you know, I just put my time in it. Time in. I don't need to do it. I can let off the gas. But here's what, if that's you, here's what I need you to understand. The young people, and I'm going to speak for them as a generation, us young people are crazy, we're energetic, and we will try anything. We will. I promise you we will. Young people, we have the passion to serve Jesus Christ. And we strongly believe in a quiet moment of our time and our day. We honestly believe without a doubt that we can change things for the better. We really do. That we can change people's lives. That we can make a difference in what we do. We feel strongly that we can make a reality difference, relevant difference in the life of people and in our community. Do you know what we're missing? We're missing wisdom. We're missing wisdom. We're missing someone to believe in us as a generation. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about our church. I'm talking about our society. I'm talking about our nation. I'm talking about our life. It doesn't matter. We need someone to believe in us because we are missing wisdom. There's this aching hole inside our younger generation that is looking to the previous generation and saying, do you believe in us? Do you think we can do it? And we understand, look, we may dress funny, we may have tattoos, we may look funny, we may talk funny, we may rely on cell phones and iPads for everything we do in our life, we may talk weird, we may know things that we think are irrelevant, but you know what? At the end of the day, we love Jesus Christ just as bad as you do. And I believe there's a, there's a generation out there, hear me, Caleb's, that are looking across our church and desperate want, desperately wanting you to say, yes, you can do it. Yes, I believe in you. I've said this before. I don't have this parenting thing all figured out. But it would be nice for, for someone to look and say, you know, you're going to make it through your teenage years. You know? It's bad, but we made it. You know, you're doing a good job. You know? You're not arrested yet. You know? You know, hell. But I need someone to look across and say, I believe you can do it. I believe in you. And we need this, this generation of Caleb's to, to come along and say, you know what? Let us bring our wisdom alongside of you to help you be more efficient. 
Let us come and walk right beside you and help you to look out for blind spots that you're too young to notice yet. You have something vital to give to us. We need to hear you say, I've made some mistakes in my life and this is what I've learned. Because you know what, if I can be honest, if I can be truly honest and I speak for a generation here this morning, here's what I want you to know. We need to hear it because where we sit, we think you're perfect. And there's no sarcasm in there. That's true. We look on you and, and we look on you and we say to ourselves, I hope we're like them when we're your age. I mean, Kelly and I look on marriages around here that are 50, 30, 60 years still going strong. And we say to each other, I hope we're like that when we're that age. We need that. We think you're perfect. We need your wisdom. We need your... We need... We need... Most of all, we need your belief in us. And I don't think it's possible for our church to become everything God wants it to become in the coming years without your wisdom and your confidence. For my Caleb sitting out there, we need you. We can't do it without you. My last point is an area of advancement I believe that God's calling a season of advancement for giving. I believe that, that God has given us a vision to reach the 75% of the people in our community who do not attend a faith community on a regular basis. I believe God is calling us to advance and that means that we have to give more time, more money, more resources, and more talent than we have right now. It's and I know if you've been here, I know that you know that, that, that I have, because it has been my experience, my upbringing, I've always viewed a church as a faith family. It's an extension of my family. It's an extension of, of, of how I was raised. And, and you, know, you know, I was such a bad kid, my parents probably couldn't raise me by myself, so they had a whole church come in. And, of elders and deacons. <laughs> They needed the whole, the whole community. But I believe just as a faith family, just in like our family, the four handers that live on Edgewood Lane, I believe that whenever you have needs, you don't have to call in experts. Whenever you have needs, you don't have to have to make people feel guilty. You just simply put the needs out to the family. You know, Will, I need you to help me do this. You just put it out there. And, and those in the family kind of think about it. Those in the family, if it's a big decision, maybe pray about it. Those in the family, uh, you know, will, will take some time. And, and, and then, then, you know, you just see how people respond. That's what driving the saints is all about. That's what soap is all about. That's what a three-month money-back guarantee on tithing challenge is all about. As you put it out there, you ask God what you want me to do as a church family. You just put it out there and you ask the Lord, you pray about it, you listen to God, and then you follow up and you pay. And some people do and some people don't. It doesn't mean one of them are, are, are less valuable to us. And whenever we do this, I believe in my experience to be every time I've done this, every year we do that. Because in over 150 plus years, God has never failed us once. As a faith community. God has always met the need somehow, some way, by somebody. And right now, God is calling us not to relent, but to advance. Are you ready, Joshua? Are you ready, Caleb's? God is not calling us to look at our life in areas and relent. God is calling us to advance. God, 